If you've got your Bible, open up to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, my favorite Old Testament book is the book of Nehemiah. Uh, it's just an incredible book about leadership and bringing people together in unity, dealing with adversity, dealing with your critics and people that really try to tear you down. And I love the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. I love the New Testament book of Ephesians, and I'm really excited about the next several years, I mean weeks, as we kind of walk through this. Um, Paul wrote 13 of the books that are in the New Testament. He wasn't writing books. He wasn't sitting down, didn't have a ghostwriter or whatever. He was literally writing letters to churches, and he was writing letters to people, and that makes up a big chunk of the New Testament by the time he gets to Ephesians, it would be about the third quarter, if you will, of his ministry. Um, he's been a seasoned missionary, been a seasoned pastor. He started multiple churches, kind of uh, been a leader. He has a grasp on church and functionality and our roles and our giftings, which we'll all dig into that because he really does an incredible job in the book of Ephesians. Kind of all of that wisdom and leadership that he's learned, he gets that on paper is he writes this letter. That's what the book of Ephesians is. It was a letter to the Christians that were in the church of Ephesus. We're still in Ephesians chapter one. We'll probably be several weeks in Ephesians chapter one just because there is just so much good content that's in there. So Ephesians chapter one, verse one. If you're new with us, I'm really glad that you found us. Um, our typical campus is on the south side of the river. Uh, but I'm glad you, you came to Schoolhouse, and we're, we're really glad that you're here. I, I normally preach out of the New Living Translation. I was introduced to that back in 2001. Somebody, I worked in radio back then, and somebody gave us a box of them, and I took it home and just kind of fell in love with it. I grew up in the King James and went to a little Christian school for a while, and we had to memorize Scripture, and yea, verily, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. You know, that, that's what I knew. But as I read the New Living, I didn't really have to do a lot of extra study to just understand what was going on. But the way I preach, I preach out of the New Living, but then I bring in other versions of the Bible as well, and I'm going to do that a lot. But we gotta, we're going to kind of walk through the life of the Apostle Paul, which will help you understand why he says what he says just in Ephesians chapter one, verse one. So out of the New Living Translation, verse one, it says this letter, this book, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. There's a lot right there, right? right. I could literally spend about three weeks just on that first sentence. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Now, Pastor Matt did an incredible job last week kicking off our series as, as we began in Ephesians. And, and really giving us this powerful, memorable overview of the book of Ephesians. Three words, sit, walk, and stand. I'm, I'm gonna sit, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're called to walk together in unity. And then we need to stand firm. We'll get to that towards the end of Ephesians. Stand firm against the attacks of the enemy. But today I want us just to stay in Ephesians chapter one, Verse one, because there's a continual thought there that keeps appearing throughout Paul's teachings, throughout his letters, throughout his writings. You'll see it a lot in Galatians. You really see it in 2 Corinthians. And we'll look at some of that today. You see it in other places as well. As he gets older, this, this continual point kind of becomes a little bit less and a little bit less. But keep in mind, Ephesians was written in about the third quarter of his ministry, okay? Here's the point that you see a lot in the theme of Paul's life and his ministry. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God. Chosen by the will of God. There's an older translation I read from the New Living. There's actually a living Bible. Uh, and I, I like the way it says it too because it makes just, just a little more pointed at the point Paul's making here. Dear Christian friends at Ephesus, ever loyal to the love, this is Paul writing to you, chosen by God to be Christ's messenger. If you don't know a lot about Paul's life, you don't know his story, it's just a name you hear. And quite frankly, it's a little bit confusing because sometimes we refer to him as Saul, sometimes we refer to him as Paul. There's another significant Saul that's in the Bible. He was the first king of the nation of Israel that was hundreds and hundreds of years before the life of this Paul. Um, this may, if you don't know Paul, this may just, okay, well, he just something he says to everybody that, hey, I'm Paul, called by God. But I want to use this moment 
and I want to use this reoccurring idea. Like, why does Paul keep saying that? Why does Paul keep saying, I'm called by God? I'm called by God. I'm called by God. So I want to use this moment before we go any further into Ephesians to unpack his life. I know there's three of us in the room that really enjoy history. The rest of you, we love you. Just, you know, we'll wake you up in about 12 minutes, all right? But I want to, I want to go through briefly and just kind of scratch the surface a little bit of the history of Paul's life because some of the events that happen are why he continually says, I'm called by God, I'm called by God, I'm called by God. So here's the idea Paul's at. God chose me, man did not. As we walk through his life, I think you'll understand why Paul continually makes this point. God chose me, no man called me. I'm called by God to be a messenger for Christ, okay? So I wanna do this. I wanna kind of build a little bit of a timeline of the major events in Paul's life. He was born roughly 5 AD. So depending on where you put the birth of Jesus, he's eight, 10 years younger than Jesus was. He was born in a place called Tarsus. I wanna put that map up on the screen. It's a Roman city um, in, in Sicily. Now that's modern day Turkey. You can say it's close to being a coastal city. We would learn through Paul's writings of his Hebrew name, and Pastor Matt did a good job kind of explaining that Hebrew name being Saul, but his non-Jewish name, when he talked to people that that Scripture would refer to as Gentiles, he would be referred to as Paul. And that's where Paul's ministry would be, is Paul would literally leave Jerusalem. He would leave many times the Middle East, and he would go to Asia Minor. He would go to the southern part of Europe, and he would reach people who were not of Jewish descent. And so many times that's why he's referred to as Paul. Um, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Let me, let me, if you're still in Ephesians 1, you can kind of stay there. But Philippians 3 says this, and Paul's talking about his heritage. He's like, I was circumcised when I was eight days old because that's what you did to a young Jewish baby. I am pure-blooded citizen of Israel, had a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a real Hebrew if there ever was one, okay? I'm a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. So he's saying, listen, if there was ever a Jewish kid, I was him. I was circumcised on the circumcised on the day when I'm supposed to be. I'm born of the tribe of Benjamin. Some of you don't even know what tribe you're from. I know my tribal heritage. I'm a Hebrew if there ever was one. In Acts 22, he gives a similar kind of sermon, if you will. He's preaching in Jerusalem. He addresses the crowd, and he gives us some more insight to his lineage and his birth and, and his upbringing. Acts 22, verse 3, then Paul said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus, city, city in Sicily. I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. That's a big deal. His, Gamaliel would have been a well-known teacher, really almost a professor, if you will, of Jewish culture and religion and teaching. As his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very passionate, very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. So he tells us here he was trained in Jerusalem under Gamaliel and... Um, After that, we don't know a lot about Paul for about a 25-year period. But he tells us where he was born, where he's from. He's a Jew of Jews. He's a tribe of Benjamin and who he was educated under. Okay, so in that 25 years of silence, the ministry of Jesus comes along. Again, Jesus would be a little bit older than Paul, but but Jesus begins to preach and, and teach. And he would be arrested. He would be put on trial. He would be crucified. He would be laid in a tomb. He would resurrect on the third day. He would spend time with his followers and disciples. And then Jesus would ascend into heaven. There's a good chance. Paul never talks about it. There's a good chance he saw Jesus face to face, or not necessarily face to face, but that he saw him teach. He probably was in Jerusalem when Jesus was there teaching, probably was at the trial, I mean, because at that point, Paul was a Pharisee. At that point, Paul was deeply ingrained in the Jewish culture. If you recall the story of Jesus' crucifixion, his trial, and his arrest, one of his 12 disciples by the name of Judas betrayed Jesus. And after Judas realized what he had done, he took the money that he was paid, went back and and gave it back, and he hung himself, committed suicide. So now there's not 12 disciples there's only 11. So we need to replace Judas. We gotta get back to that number 12. Acts chapter one tells that story, okay? 
So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. Boy, I'm telling you, all their names. <laughs> like his brother's got three names. And Matthias. Then they all prayed, O Lord, we, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and he's gone where he belongs. Verse 26, then they cast lots and Matthias was selected to become apostle with the other 11. Dear Lord, show us which one you want. And then they basically played their version of spin the bottle. <laughs> they cast lots and it landed to Matthias and he was chosen, whether God directed the bottle or they were kind of doing their own thing, but he was chosen to replace Jesus and become that 12th apostle, okay? I think, some don't, but I think this is a thing. I don't think Matthias was supposed to be that 12th apostle. I don't think they were supposed to fill that role just yet. I think that 12th apostle wasn't even saved yet. I think that 12th apostle hadn't even come to his place because there would become an apostle, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means, but there would become an apostle who would be sent to the Gentiles, and that would be Paul. I think Paul was supposed to be that 12th apostle, but clearly here they picked Matthias. They believed the Lord had guided them to that. About 30 AD, okay, Paul is passionately trying to stop this Christianity thing. He's passionately trying to stop the followers of Jesus. He's persecuting Christians. Acts chapter 7 tells the story, and really it's the first time he pops up into the story. But, but one of Jesus' followers, a guy by the name of Stephen, was stoned. And in the older translation says that, that Saul or Paul held their coats there's some significance into that, but, but it also means that he gave his approval. It's quite possible he was one of the Pharisees overseeing that moment, and he gave his approval of that, okay? One day, Paul is on his way to a town called Damascus, and he is on a mission sent by the high priest to arrest, to persecute these followers of Jesus, these Christians. And this life-changing moment takes place. Paul is confronted by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Yes, he'd been crucified, buried, resurrected. He'd walked the earth. He ascended. His disciples watched him ascend up into heaven. But in this moment, Jesus appears back on this road to Damascus. And he says, Saul, why are you messing with my people? Why are you persecuting me? And this was a life-changing moment moment for Paul. So roughly that happened in 33, 34 AD. In that story, you can read that in Acts chapter 9. So from that moment, that life-changing encounter where Jesus, who's supposed to be gone, literally confronts Paul. Paul becomes a follower of Christ. Well, obviously the Christians didn't trust him because he was just putting people in prison. You were the guy that was at the stoning of Stephen. I don't trust you. What if you're like trying to be a spy and infiltrate the circle, but a guy by the name of Ananias said, I trust you. I trust you that God's doing something significant in your life. So Paul was saved, and right after he was saved, he went into this time of isolation. Really, that was kind of his version of Bible school. Like he just, he went off and spent some time just, just to be with God. Galatians 1 tells us that story. Paul says, but even before I was born, God chose me called me by his marvelous grace, then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush to consult with any human being, okay? So God called him by his grace. I didn't just go start preaching. I didn't run to the apostles in Jerusalem and say, hey, make me a teacher, make me a pastor. I didn't. He's like, I got saved and then I realized I got a lot of learning to do. Verse 17, nor did I go to Jerusalem to consult with any of those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away to Arabia and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Verse 18, then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter and I stayed with him for 15 days. Verse 19, the only other apostle I met with at the time was James. That's the Lord's brother. The point I want you to see is for three years after Paul got saved, he just disappeared. He went away into the wilderness of Arabia just to figure it all out. Think about this. He had to rewire his worldview 
because he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Jew of Jews. He was a Hebrew of Hebrew. He was proudly of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. He was chasing and persecuting these Christians. And now he himself has been confronted by Jesus. He himself is a Christian. All of a sudden, his entire life, everything he'd been taught is completely upside down. He had to go off by himself. He had to unpack and unlearn. And the Holy Spirit helped him. The Holy Spirit taught him and guided him while he was in that time of isolation. Here's a huge personal lesson for you and I here. Some of you feel stuck. Some of you feel like you're in the middle of that three years of isolation, or maybe it feels like four or five. You feel forgotten. You feel alone. I'm telling you that God is using that isolation, that season, to unpack some things. He's using that isolation to rewire you, to help you see the world in a whole new distance because he is preparing you for your next season of life. If you're still with me, say amen. Your isolation may be your season of learning. So this was Paul's version of seminary, okay? Three years in the wilderness, unlearning an old way of life. And then he goes back to meet with Peter and James in Jerusalem. We found that in Acts chapter 9, all right? And then AD 37 to uh, 46 AD, roughly, you know, nine-year period, uh, he spent several years there in his hometown of Tarsus. A man by the name of Barabbas then grabs him, brings him, and takes him to Antioch and to help teach and lead and, and, and do the ministry and grow the church there in Antioch. So, so he really hasn't been in Jerusalem much other than just a few times. He's been in Tarsus, been in isolation, and now he spends time in Antioch. Acts chapter 11, verse 25, 25 says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus, looked for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. And then something big happens in Acts chapter 13. Among the prophets and the teachers of the church in Antioch, that's where they're at, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menean, and Saul. One day these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting and the Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I've called them. So they're in this time of prayer and seeking the Lord, even fasting, and they get a reward. They receive a word. It says, appoint Barnabas and Saul. I have a special work for them. So after more fasting and prayer, they laid hands on them and they sent them, they commissioned them, they sent them on their way. A couple of notes of importance. This did not happen in Jerusalem. This was not the 11, now 12 apostles. This was not James, Peter, John, Matthias. This was not that group. This happened at the church at Antioch. The elders, those apostles from Jerusalem, did not commission them out. No James, no Peter, okay? And Jerusalem was kind of the home base for Christianity, if you will. But Paul and Barnabas would have this moment where the leaders of Antioch would lay hands on them and send them out. Just want you to understand, this was not in Jerusalem, and this was not the 12 apostles sending them out and commissioning them, because I think that is always an issue for Paul, okay? So Paul and Barnabas set out on their ministry. They go. They tell people about Jesus. They see people get saved. But then there starts to be this confusion arising among these early new Christians. There are people that are saying, well, if you're going to get saved, if you're going to accept Jesus, Jesus was a Jew. Jewish, Jesus went to the Jewish people. You have to become Jewish first, and then you can become a Christian. And so this teaching starts to spring up, and Paul's like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me, let, me tell you about, let me tell you about being Jewish and the three years in Arabia. I'm just telling you, I wasn't saved because I was a good Jew. I was saved because of the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ. So in 49 AD, Paul, got, we got to settle this. We, we've got we to we settle this teaching, and he does what he does. He creates a little bit of an issue, and he goes to Jerusalem to the 12 apostles, James, Peter, John, Matthias, Thaddeus, Bartholomew, the, the 12 disciples that were, the 11 disciples that were with Jesus and now Matthias. And he go, listen, we've got an issue. And this is where the council of Jerusalem takes place. And some good things come out of this. Acts chapter 15 tells the story 
of what happens at the Council of Jerusalem. And all the church leaders there have this conversation, and it's the foundation that we are saved by faith, not by works. That was the decision they came to. We're saved because of our faith in Jesus Christ, not by becoming a Jew or not by keeping a Jewish custom. And so the result of the council at Jerusalem is that Gentiles are not required to be circumcised. They're not required to convert to Judaism and then become a Christian. You just go straight to Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen. That's the whole point of the book of Galatians is Paul is countering this theology that, well, you have to become Jewish and then you can become saved. The whole book of Galatians takes it on. No, 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 no. You go straight to Jesus. You go straight to the saving power of his blood that was shed upon the cross. Okay. So then he would go on a second mission trip. What's interesting about this one is Paul and Barnabas They were companions on the first trip. Well, they have a little bit of a falling out and a disagreement, so they split, okay? You you hate that that there's tension in the relationship, but really a good thing from this. So instead of one mission trip with two guys, there's now two mission trips with four guys. So Paul takes a companion, Barnabas takes a companion, and they go their own way. Paul traveled through this region called Asia Minor, and I know that's confusing because when you think of Asia, you think of the Orient, but Asia Minor was actually a almost a state, if you will, of the Roman Empire, and you would go through Asia Minor to get to the Asian continent. But when I say Asia, I'm not talking about him going to China. It's it's really this Roman continent of Asia Minor, and then Paul goes up on into Europe. He would go to Philippi, Thessalonica, and Corinth. Okay, spent significant time in Corinth. Saw a lot of people get saved while he was there. He wrote the book of First, or wrote the letters. Uh, that are First and Second Thessalonians that are in our Bible. Most likely he was in Corinth when he wrote those letters. And then he concludes that trip and goes back to Jerusalem and kind of gives an update of what happens. Then he heads out on his third mission journey. And that takes place from 53 to 57 AD, okay? Paul, Paul sent a big chunk of time in Ephesus on that trip. And that, that's the book that we're reading through. That's the, the church that he wrote to. And in fact, Ephesus really became one of the fruitful churches of the New Testament. It really became a healthy church. Um, Paul would leave a young disciple there by the name of Timothy. Timothy would become the pastor of Ephesus. That church would become vibrant and growing. History tells us that it would reach to over 3,000 people at one point. And so Paul would also, on that third mission trip, go back into Asia Minor, and he would spend some time in Greece. While he's on this mission trip, he would write the book of Galatians, the letter, Galatians. Uh, He wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians, and then he wrote the book of Romans, which is really a masterful, almost a legal piece of work, if you will. We believe he was in Corinth when he wrote the book of Romans, okay? When he gets back from his third mission trip, he goes to Jerusalem to report his work, all right? Now, I need you to just gently nudge your neighbor and make sure they're still awake, you know, because I, my history, whew, help me, Jesus. This is not on the ACT, okay? In 57 AD, Paul was arrested, okay? I'm gonna tell you, I really thought about doing a flannel graph, you know what I'm saying, for all of us old school folks, like, you know, with the thing, but the closest I could get was my little cartoon buddy Paul up there in the corner, and he's got the two thing, thing you know what I'm saying? So, all right, so Paul was arrested, he was in prison for three years. Those stories are told, Acts 21 through Acts 26. During this time, he would get some really cool opportunities to appear before some Roman officials. He would appear before Felix, a guy by the name of Festus, and King Agrippa. And because he really was imprisoned and they couldn't find any reason, like one of them actually says, listen, buddy, I'd let you go but you pulled a Roman legal move. If you were a Roman citizen, which Paul was, he was fully Jewish, but he was also a full Roman citizen. If you were a Roman citizen, you had a right to appeal to their Supreme Court. Their Supreme Court was one person, a guy by the name of Caesar, like the guy. And so Paul felt like he was wrongly imprisoned. He appealed to Caesar. And so in order to get to, he just, okay, well, we can't let you go. So he remained in very, light prison style, if you would, all right? Now, Caesar might hear your case. Caesar might not hear your case. We don't know. We don't think that he ever heard Paul's case, 
But while he's waiting for Caesar to hear his case, he was on house arrest in Rome, which means he probably had a guard that stayed with him, but it, it wasn't like a dungeon. There will be time where he spent times in a dungeon. But he's on house arrest. His friends brought him food. People could come see him. He could still teach and preach. He couldn't leave the house, but he was there on house arrest. This is where we think he wrote what we call the prison letters. Uh, there's a church term called epistle, and I know that's confusing because it sounds very similar to apostle, two different things. An apostle is a person that is sent. He's a messenger. An epistle is a letter. And so these are the prison epistles. These are the prison letters, okay? The book of Ephesians that we're walking through, it was written while he was in house arrest in Rome. Philippians is a prison letter. Colossians, Philemon, okay? From 60 to 62 AD is when he wrote those prison letters, if you will. Now, this is where things get a little bit fuzzy on Paul's life. We don't know whether Caesar did or didn't hear him. There is also this thread that Paul was released for a time and traveled one more time, but we don't know for certain. So from about 62 to 66 AD, there's a chance there was a little bit more travel after his release from that you know, home imprisonment, if you will. Um, he possibly went to Spain. I'm not gonna argue with about that. Some of you will come up and have, Paul, no, we went to Spain. Nobody. Okay, 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 okay. We know he wanted to. And there's some out there that think it's possible there was just another little mission trip in there. Romans 15 doesn't say that he did, but it says that he was planning to, okay? So 15, 24 says, I'm planning to go to Spain, and when I do, I'm gonna stop off in Rome. After I've enjoyed the fellowship for a little while, you can provide for my journey, okay? In this time period, okay, between 62, 66, he would write 1 Timothy, who he had left Timothy in Ephesians or Ephesus, and he, would, he wouldn't necessarily write the church, but he would write a young pastor and a young leader to encourage him. And then he wrote another man he had discipled who had left and left him leading a church, a guy by the name of Titus. Okay, From 66 to 67 AD, Paul was arrested one more time and imprisoned. This time he'll be in Rome under a brutal Roman emperor that set out to kill and destroy Christians, a guy by the name of Nero. If you get all the way to 70 AD, he would be the guy that would ultimately destroy Jerusalem, destroying the temple that's never been rebuilt. Okay, So Paul would be arrested and again imprisoned. While he's in prison this time, it's not home arrest. He is literally in a dungeon. You can, you can go to Rome. You can see it. It's, it's dark. It, it's, a, it's a pretty tough place. Paul would write his swan song of a letter. That is 2 Timothy. It's his last letter, and it's written shortly before he would die, and you hear that, hey, I'm done. I just about wrapped this bad boy up. Daddy out. I'm, I'm going to leave you with it. 2 Timothy 4, 6, very famous verses out of the New Testament. Paul says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. That, that is beautiful. Can you say that about your life? As for me, my life has been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And in all that, I have remained faithful. I think that's some of the most beautiful verses of the New Testament. It's powerful. Actually, that verse is inscribed upon my father's headstone. According to tradition, not the Bible, according to tradition, Paul was executed by beheading in Rome roughly around 67 AD. What a ministry. Span over 30 years, three, maybe a fourth mission trip, two imprisonments. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he gives quite a laundry list of his trials, his journeys, his pains, his perseverings that all begin on that one day on a road to Damascus where Jesus radically changed his life forever. Paul gave his very life for the sake of the gospel. So Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, it, it, it stands out to me a little bit. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God. Chosen by the will of God. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, this letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father. You didn't pick me. They didn't pick me. The bunch at Jerusalem didn't pick me. I wasn't picked by a man. I was picked by God called by Christ himself. 
Colossians 1.1 says the same thing. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God. First and second Corinthians begin the same way. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle for Christ Jesus. Most of his letters, not all of them, but most of his letters begin with this greeting. This is Paul, chosen by God to be a sent person, to be a sent man. For Jesus Christ. We'll get into the meaning of apostle in the coming weeks. So Paul, why do you repeat that? Is that that just your regards? Like, is that your signature? But the problem is not every letter started that way. Paul, why were you so committed to this language? Because if you unpack the New Testament, by the time you get to 2 Corinthians, he would go into great detail why he begins those letters that way. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 11, and 12 are late, like in your Bible as you're reading that, a lot of the, the Bible translations will go in and, and they'll label a chunk and it literally says, Paul defends his authority. Some translations say, Paul defends his apostleship, okay? And so for those three chapters, Paul just goes. He just goes. Second Corinthians 11, five, I do not consider myself inferior anyway to super apostles, Okay, you can almost somewhat read the sarcasm in what he's talking about. Is he talking about the apostles out of Jerusalem? Possible. Is he talking about other guys that were apostles that were traveling? Because Paul wasn't the only one. There's a guy named Apollos who would be doing the same thing. He would be going and teaching Jesus and seeing people get saved. But there there were other people that were going doing them. And Paul's like, listen, I'm not inferior to anybody because nobody called me. God himself is the one that called me. People are messy. Leadership is messy. Some people are really big on titles. Paul was just big on telling people about Jesus. Some people would say, well, Paul's not an apostle like Peter and James and even Matthias. Paul wasn't appointed by the Jerusalem church. He was only appointed by the Antioch church. And it feels like all of Paul's ministry He's chasing this idea of his authority, of his authority, of his authority. And so finally, he spends pages just defending himself. And it feels like the church at Corinth made the biggest deal out of this. Well, Paul, you're not Peter, so, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, and that, maybe so. Corinth was highly educated, very society, like they sip their tea with their pinky out, right? That was, that was the church in Corinth, right? So in 2 Corinthians, he just devotes pages upon pages of pages, defending, listen, God called me, not a man, and I'm okay with it. But you see it in his writings. Some people are big on titles. Paul was big on telling people about Jesus. Everybody take a deep breath. Let it out. So why in the world does that matter to us? It doesn't. Love you guys. See you next week. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the lesson. You better know who you are in Christ. You better know who you are and what God called and created and made you to be and do. You better know who you are in Christ. Because we live in this deconstructive society and the world has no problem lying to you and then calling it relative truth. The world will misidentify you and say that you're the one that's confused. The world will criticize you and they will give you labels that you did not earn. So you and I better follow Paul's example and we better know who we are in Christ. It is Christ who labels me. It is Christ who calls me. It is Christ who saved me. So you can say what you want about me. I don't care. And honestly, if we could get this, all of a sudden we'd sleep better at night's. You wouldn't get so fired up about what somebody commented on your social media post. Like, it's okay. I'm called by God, not by you. Young people, wake up. I I really think if you could get this down in you now and run your race, know what God has called you to do, the person that God has for you. Because I'm going to tell you, society is going to lie to you. They're going to pull on you. They're going to beat you down. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. Number one, Work, success will tell me I am not enough. There will always be someone younger, 
There will always be someone faster, someone smarter, someone more talented, someone more willing, someone better looking, someone more able. The success model of this world will always tell you, you are not enough. So why don't you just quit? You are a failure. You're not as good as he is or she was or they are. The culture will tell you you're not pretty enough. You're not skinny enough. You don't work hard enough. You're not smart enough. You don't have enough experience. And maybe this is why Paul, this struggle that he wrestled with, always defending his authority, that I'm called by God, not by some yahoo. Maybe that's why he wrote these powerful words in Romans chapter 8. He said, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. I'm not just a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. Through Christ who loved us. Success will tell you you are never enough. You'll never get it done. You'll never be fast enough. You'll never be enough. So you better know who you are in Christ. Amen, everybody? Y'all woke up, didn't you? (laughs) Secondly, society will tell me I don't belong. Now, I'm a pretty social guy. I can navigate almost any social circle unless you put me in a room full of Sooners. And then I just don't know what to do. (laughs) I I say this, a stranger is just a friend I haven't met yet. You know, opposites attract, and then when they get married, opposites attack. You know what I'm saying? That's Jerry and I. Like, I don't don't enjoy going to events where I don't know anyone. Just give me one person a piece. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Just give me one person that I can cling to. But I don't really like going into rooms where I don't know anybody. Sometimes my situations require that. But, but I, don't, I don't like going to those settings where I don't know anybody. So I used to drag poor Jerry along, right? And if you think I don't like it, she really don't like it. That's our only fight we have. I can function in a lot of circles, right? But even OBK, society will tell you, you can't sit here. You can't sit at this table. You're not in the right clique. You gotta be in the in crowd. Young people, are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Because there's social circles that try to set all these things. You're, you, you, you're not important enough. You don't have enough money to be a part of this group. You don't wear the right clothes. You don't have the newest phone. Young people, you understand what Paul's trying to say to you? Parents, you can amen a little bit. Because hopefully, as adults, we've started to learn this a little bit to kind of help coach our kids to focus on their race and run their race and not get sucked into the society pressures that are around them. Popularity will lead you on an empty pursuit, chasing people who are unpleasable, changing the core of who you are to become a version of yourself that's not real. That was so good, I'm going to say it again. (laughs) Popularity will only lead you on an empty pursuit. Chasing people that are unpleasable, changing the core of who you are to become a version of yourself that is not real. Society will tell you, you don't belong. You better know who you are in Jesus Christ. Number three, criticism will tell me, I'm not worthy. And trust me, in 2024, there are plenty of critics. There are many who are willing to give their opinions and criticisms of you for free. All you have to do is just put yourself out there. All you have to do is try. All you have to do is lead. All you have to do is love. All you have to do with your life is attempt to make a difference for the good and someone will have some criticism for you. And it it don't really come from the people who are out there trying to make a difference. They're too busy. It comes from the people who spend their time on social media and playing armchair quarterback. I probably should have said that whole I love you BK thing first. I'm sorry about that. I I got some time. Because that that one that that one stings a little bit. People who are out there trying to make they ain't criticizing you. It's the people who ain't doing anything but thumbing on their phone. They've got the time to comment. I ain't. That's why you better know the difference between a critic and a coach. You better know the difference between a critic 
and a coach because sometimes their voices will carry the same heaviness. Sometimes their voices might sound the same, but their actions and intentions are completely different. A critic will tear you down so they can build themselves up. A coach will build you up so that you can succeed. That's why you better know who you are in Christ because the critics will kill you one painful word at a time. Number four, you guys with me? Pain will tell me I'm not lovable. I know this one well. Some of you know this one well. Have you ever been cheated on? You ever been left? You ever been abandoned? Those words cut deep and last long in an uncorrected narrative in our mind. It tells us we are unlovable. No one would love me. Nobody else would stay with me. No one would follow me. But there's one. He died for you because of his great love for you. Don't let the enemy turn your pain into a false price tag on your life that says you are unlovable. You are so worthy. Christ gave his life for you. Amen, everybody. I'll say this lastly. Number five. The enemy will tell me I'm not saved. The enemy will tell me I'm not a child of God. Well, actually, because at first he will tell you you're not savable. At first he'll tell you, man, you're pretty messed up. God can't love you. God, God's grace is big. It ain't that big. God won't accept you. Those people, th- those people are nothing like you. Look at them. They're all, they got their stuff together. Those people are nothing like you. Those, if you do this, all those people are going to do is just, they're going to learn about you and they're just going to judge you. That's what the enemy will tell you. But if he can't stop you there, if you do, Give in to the invitation and the pull and the grace of the Holy Spirit calling you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do get saved, then he just tries to cause confusion. Well, you didn't mean it. You were too young. You didn't you didn't mean that. That that wasn't real. That wasn't you you just did some emotional thing. That's not real. Oh I saw what you did though. You you don't mess that up. You mess that up. Uh, I don't think you said I don't think you did it right. Did you really mean Oh, you sinned again. You messed that up. You, you lost all over again. And so the enemy wants to keep you stuck in the infancy of your salvation. He wants you to just, res- am I saved, am I saved, am I saved? And like, yeah. Jesus saved you the minute you asked him to. Jesus saved you the minute you invited him to become your Lord and your Savior. And if he can just keep you stuck and try to convince you you're not saved, and so you can never never take that next, well, I don't know, I gotta do it again, I don't know. And if he can just keep you stuck there, then your life never gets to the next step of growth. And your life never gets to being spiritually mature where you actually can take your sin, your salvation, God's sanctification in your life, and you can go over and help somebody else. Listen, the devil used to tell me I wasn't lovable. Let me tell you how much God did love me and he met with me one day and it radically changed my life call somebody the enemy wants to tell you you're not savable that's a lie we'll find out in Ephesians chapter 2 before you were ever born really before God ever said let there be light God may he knew you He knew you were going to be. He created you. He had a specific plan and a purpose. And regardless of how many stupid decisions we've made in our life, God still says your life is usable for your good and for his glory. And we're going to get there. Might be next year. I'm just kidding. But the world will tell you you're not savable. But the spirit of the living God wants to say differently. All you have to do is just say yes to that pool of God's Holy Spirit inviting you. And call. Jesus gave us salvation on a cross. And Paul would spend over 30 years of his life explaining 
and sharing and teaching people how all that works. And we're going to get there too. My question for you this morning is, has the devil been lying to you? Has he been telling you you're not savable? God, God wouldn't, God couldn't, you, you're too messed up. Look at all those people, they got their stuff together. I, I mean, I know that one's a little bit, but I mean, he ain't as bad as you. And I'm just here to tell you there's an invitation this morning from the Holy Spirit to become a child of God. You don't have to become Jewish first. You don't have to keep their set of rules and their laws. Jesus paid a way that you and I can come straight to the throne of grace and say, God, would you make me one of your children? Here's the gospel, as simple as I can make it, that all of, all of us, all of us, all of us are messed up. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And while I was dead and stuck in that sin, there wasn't anything I could do about it. Christ died. He shed his blood. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for my sin. He said, I'll go shed my blood. And because of his sacrifice on that cross, you and I now have a pathway that we can step into relationship with God. Paul would tell the Christians in Rome, all you have to do, it's not, it's not complicated, all you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Believe in your heart, God miraculously raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. That's it. You gotta clean nothing up yet. You just gotta come to Jesus. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Here's what I wanna do this morning before I let you go. I wanna give you the opportunity to confess and believe because I think in this room or maybe even online, the enemy's been lying to somebody saying you're not savable and today we're gonna prove the enemy wrong. So all across this room with every head bowed, every eye closed, don't put your stuff away just yet. Just, just be real still. Nobody move. If you're here today, and I've, the last three minutes I've been speaking right to you. You know that you need this. I'm not going to embarrass you. You don't have to walk the aisle. You don't have to talk to anybody but God. I'm gonna help you confess and believe. The best way I know how to do that is through a prayer. So I'm just gonna lead you in a simple prayer. Right there where you're sitting, just repeat these words right after me. You ready? Just pray this prayer, dear Heavenly Father. Right there, just say that, dear Heavenly Father. I come to you today because I need you. I'm lost. I'm a sinner. And I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking for an encounter that will change my life forever. Would you come into my life? I may not understand all of this, but I'm taking a step of faith. And today, Jesus, I completely give my whole life to you. All across this room, every head bowed, every eye closed, you're here today. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna ask you to walk up. I'm not gonna ask you to stand up. I'm not gonna... If you prayed that prayer, would you just slipply lift up your hand real high so I can see it? Slip them up real high. Okay, I see it. Anybody else? Slip it up real high. Okay, I see it. Thank you. Thank you. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Spirit of the living God, you see several hands across this room today of people. Father, defeating the lie of the enemy. You've been telling them they're not savable. Today, God, we know they are saved because they ask you to. You're a God of your promise that if I confess and believe, you saved me. Lord, I pray you fill them with your spirit. We know he has such a role in our life, God, and we're gonna talk about it in the coming days. I pray that you help them understand this is huge. There's so much, Father, just help them take their next step. Help them take their next step. Bring great Christians into their life to encourage them and just help them, Father, to understand what it means to be a Christian. Lord, I love you. I'm excited about what you're doing. In the beautiful, matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, come on, let's give God the biggest praise you got. Amen. Come on, everybody.